Good morning to everyone, uh, and welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, my name is Kevin Carey. I'm the director of the Education Policy Program. Um, we have a really terrific program here this morning. We really appreciate all of you um, coming down to spend some time with us. Um, the thing we're going to be talking about um, is an area that's of great interest, actually, to two of the programs here at the New America Foundation, the um, Education Policy Program and also the Open Technology Institute. Uh, both of which are committed to providing um, enhanced access to the highest quality education to children across the United States of America. Um, and today we're here to talk about a specific part of that challenge, um, which is the Federal Communications Commission's E-Rate program. E-Rate, as you know, helps provide ubiquitous and affordable access to communications technologies at schools and libraries throughout the United States, um, and as the Federal Communications Commission now moves to modernize the E-Rate program to meet the technological needs of schools and libraries moving into the 21st century, um, we all recognize that a nuanced understanding of both the education landscape and the technological considerations will be necessary for meaningful reform. Um, so we're here to talk this morning about the evolving role of schools and libraries in the age of digital learning, um, about how to invest in a 21st century um, infrastructure to support online learning. Um, and we, we all understand that these are areas where E-Rate will play um, a major rule, role. So we have a great panel this morning. We have a diverse uh, group of representatives from education, from library sciences, um, and the technology communities all to kind of come together and bring their different perspectives to this issue. <clears throat> Pardon me. And we are very fortunate um, to have uh, former FCC Chairman Reed Hunt with us. Um, who is going to uh, start the conversation. Um, as I'm sure you all know, during Chairman Hunt's uh, tenure at the FCC, um, he saw over implementation of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which established the E-Rate program um, and also changed telecommunications in America in ways that um, we're all still um, uh, feeling. Um, and we know that throughout his career, uh, Chairman Hunt has been a tremendous advocate for universal connectivity, um, and we're very pleased to have us with him this morning. Um, before we start, a few things. I want to uh, especially thank the Urban Libraries Council for their partnership in today's event. Um, this event is being live streamed, um, and a recording of the event will be available on the New America Foundation website uh, after the event is over. Um, and for those of you in the room and out watching us on the internet, um, we'd encourage you to continue the conversation on Twitter um, using the hashtag Connected Communities. Um, so again, on behalf of New America, um, I welcome all of you, and we are going to begin um, with some remarks from Chairman Hunt. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, it's a uh, great thrill to be here. Thanks to New America for uh, pulling us all together. There are many, many experts in the fields of libraries, the fields of knowledge in the room. Uh, I really uh, should acknowledge each and every one of you, and you'll have to forgive me because I just want to uh, recognize the uh, wisdom and the passion that's here, and then talk uh, to you directly about the history and the future, or more precisely, the future and how the history can inform it uh, of the of the E-rate. I think that we're at a, a momentous and uh, completely uh, fantastic uh, moment in history because we have new uh, technologies of communication and new techniques of digitization that have come together uh, with a, a very spirited executive branch and a very spirited uh, administrative agency and a well-meaning Congress uh, to, uh, to ask us all to reimagine what could and should be done with the E-rate. And all these technologies are out there for all of us to say, well, what can we do with them? How should they be used? How can we produce a completely transformative experience of learning and uh, knowledge acquisition for all Americans? That's where we are right now. That's where we are right now. Uh, I want to uh, talk to you particularly from the library vantage point where I've learned so much from Susan Benton, the CEO of the Urban Libraries Council, from Susan Hildreth, over at IMLS, and, and as I said, many others uh, here in this room and, and, and who are not here but are represented uh, in spirit. So um, 
What's the uh, particular uh, useful way I would humbly suggest to think about the role of libraries in terms of the internet? <clears throat> There are uh, 90 million adult Americans who are not in the workforce. That is the biggest number in the history of our country. It is the biggest percentage of adults not in the workforce in the history of our country. There are two reasons. Uh, one is demographic. It's the baby boomers like me who are moving into retirement. I don't seem to be one of an example of that, but it is certain to happen to all of us, and it's a big, large demographic group that is leaving the workforce. The other reason is uh, uh, not as inevitable uh, and is uh, something that the whole country is still dealing with, and that is we have a very, very large number of people who are unemployed. The percentage has been going down during the Obama administration, but the quantity, because it's a percentage of a bigger population, is a very, very large multi-million number. We also have a large number of adult Americans who are sort of in the workforce, part-time, uh, menial jobs, and when you add all these adults together, you have more than 100 million Americans who do not have broadband access at work. They are not sitting at desks, they are not all wired up the way the businesses have wired up everybody else. I'm not talking now about school age uh, children. I'm not talking about a different and equally compelling problem, which is what do we do to meld new technologies with the education experience. I'm talking about adult Americans. Now, none of us knew at the time that the E-rate was conceived and at the time that it was passed, none of us knew that what would happen now, 17 years later, <laughs> uh, what would happen is that libraries would become the number one public internet access point in the entire civic landscape. But actually, almost everybody involved with the E-rate thought it probably would happen. But no one knew that it would be such a big fact. No one knew that the only alternatives that would be available for free public internet access would be it's not free. By telling uh, somebody, well, you know, you don't have a job, why don't you go buy a cappuccino and sit for a couple of hours in the Starbucks, that's not a, a generous, charitable, or frankly, workable solution. That's not a workable solution. So libraries have come to play a, world, a, a role in the internet society <laughs> that we all are now part of that is, uh, that is of uh, I inexpressible significance. As we think about that particular role, I also know that everybody here knows that libraries themselves have evolved to be places not just of providing access to information, but of hosting experiences of many, many different kinds. Teaching English as a second language, providing educational resources that build community, people go there to learn, and there are many, many other structural reasons in our society why libraries are the forums for these activities. But all of these developments only emphasize the critical nature of solving the problem of providing this, this huge flow of information to and from libraries because this is the place for the 100 million Americans who, who you cannot say, go get that broadband at work. Now you all might say to me, well, why don't they have broadband at home? And I would say the following to you, the statistics are actually that about one-third of all American households don't have broadband at home. And so it turns out that we're dealing with thirds here. About a third of all ad Americans are adult Americans who don't have broadband at work, and about a third of all homes don't have broadband at home. Are they the exact same third? I haven't done the statistical study we could do the statistical study, it's going to turn out that these two sets overlap hugely because most uh, people of retirement age don't have very much money and because it goes without saying that if you're unemployed, you're not saying, why don't I spend $200 on the triple play from the cable company per month? So that's the problem statement. I'm not talking about children and I'm not demeaning or in any way belittling that problem. I'm saying that what's happened is that the, uh, that the problem or opportunity of internet access and libraries has become very clearly different 
in degree and kind and importance from the problem of providing the Internet in educational institutions. So what is to be done? Uh, first, I think uh, it has to be recognized that it's necessary for everybody in government who's in the business of being data driven and making decisions based on data and necessary for everybody in the library community to figure out how to describe what is the current condition. I respectfully submit that a useful measurement would be what is the bandwidth available per user at peak hours in libraries? Bandwidth per user, peak hours. Bandwidth per user, peak hours. Why do I say that? Why do I talk about peak hours? Because when it's really hot in the summer and everybody turns the air conditioning on, nobody expects the electricity industry to say, these are peak hours, really, you just really need to be unhappy right now. And so let's not have any electricity during these peak hours. Nobody expects any utility anywhere in the economy to plan for non-peak hours. Everybody expects all utilities in every place in the economy, roads at times of heavy traffic, colleges when people really want to apply and really want to go. Everybody expects utilities to plan for peak hours. Why shouldn't they expect libraries to plan for peak hours? In terms of per user, you can have a lot of bandwidth for a million people and when they all share it, it ends up with hardly anything for anybody. Or you can have just five megabits for a library that happens to have one person in it and that's plenty. <laughs> so just saying, well, the fiber carries these many bits to the door, that's not the answer. We need to know the bandwidth per user. Now these measurements, which may be unusual for the world of education are utterly completely normal for every business in the United States and are done all the time on every single campus. Uh, there's a company called ASIA, A-S-S-I-A, that has developed a free software application. Uh, I'm on the board, so that's how I know that they did it. Uh, it was developed so that the businesses that buy ASIA to increase bandwidth and pay would have a way of measuring the difference between what is and what should be. But this could be used by any library. You, it's an app, a free app on a smartphone. Take the application, stand in the room, look at it, and it will tell you, well, you're only getting 126 kilobits a second, or whatever is the outcome. And we don't have to do it in every single library, every single hour. There are statistically uh, valid techniques. So we need to know what is. And when we look at what is, I know what we're going to find from all the anecdotes that I've been showered with for the last year, which is we're going to find that what is is so slow that, in fact, the learning experiences in these peak hours really are impossible, really are impossible. You can't go uh, watch. I mean, this is a thing that, that I do, but it's really stupid. But I'll, I'll, all my examples that are personal are stupid, so I'll share my <laughs> stupid example. But I uh, have enrolled on YouTube for a course called Minute Physics, Minute Physics. And my theory with Minute Physics is if it's more than a minute, I can't take it in. So you watch the Minute Physics and they, they say things like, well, you know, how come like things fall to the ground? Oh, it's gravity. This is a great learning experience for me. But all kidding aside, whatever you want to learn on the Internet, you can't learn it unless you have enough bandwidth to have that communication come to you and that's a case of video and when you're dealing with 100 kilobits a second, you, you can't do it. Just physically, it can't be done. can't be done. You can't uh, fill out uh, an application for Obamacare. You can't interact with Social Security. You can't participate in society. You know, I'm not here to make jokes about or to support Obamacare. I am here to make a point about Obamacare. It's the first national public program that was completely internet-based from the beginning. All national programs and all state programs from this day forth will always be primarily and maybe exclusively based on the internet to participate in any way at all <laughs> in any of the interactions in society at the government level or the business level or the social level from a couple of years ago to the indefinite future, you have to be on broadband. <laughs> So first we have to measure what is and compare it to what needs to be right now, and then we get to thing number two. I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. I'm very uh, blessed to have had a whole number of learning experiences be way beyond minute physics. I'm on the board of Intel. 
I've been on the board for 12 years. Every 18 months, we've doubled the price performance of uh, semiconductor parts, and it is the fundamental driving force that lies behind technology expansion. What does that have to do with the Internet? The faster and faster we compute, the faster and faster the computers demand the information. That's the deal. <laughs> the faster and faster we can compute, the faster and faster the information has to come into the computers to be calculated. Those computers that are doing the calculations are doing more and more amazing things. But you can't have your computer do any of those things for you unless your connection to the Internet keeps up with the increase in the speed of calculation of the computers. That is the fundamental reason why the computing world is pulling more and more bandwidth into all of its activities and redesigning constantly all the devices so that they don't work unless they get faster and faster bandwidth. Go back to the automobile industry. The engines get better and better and better, and then every other part has to be upgraded too, including all the roads have to be upgraded so that they can handle the cars driving in the new ways that they are driving. We're talking here about roads. We're talking about bandwidth. It has to get better and better every single year. <laughs> that means we first have to define the difference between what is and what needs to be right now and figure out how to pay for that in the most efficient manner possible. And then we have to figure out how we constantly increase access that is public and free at the same, or even better, pace that it's happening in the commercial sector. Because why would we want to repeat, and this is my little part about the past, why would we want to repeat the mistake of the E-rate that I am partly responsible or maybe only responsible for in 1997? Here's the mistake. <laughs> So when we uh, uh, thought of the E-rate, uh, and I was just a lieutenant in the Army of Thinkers, it was uh, right at the dawn, uh, the salad days of the commercial Internet, the beginning of 1994. And Republicans and Democrats in Congress and Al Gore in the White House, we all got together and said, this is an amazing thing, this Internet. <laughs> It's really going to be really, really big. The total percentage of Internet users in the United States at the time was 2%. They were almost all in the academy or MCI, which was a leader in, in this field. And everybody in the government, Republicans and Democrats, said it's going to be absolutely huge. The reason we thought it is because the technology world literally came to Washington and said, please do not blow this. Please do not get this wrong. This is really, really big. Make sure that it helps everybody. So Olympia, Rockef uh, Olympia Snow and Jay Rockefeller, Olympia on the Republican side and Jay on the Democratic side in the Senate Commerce Committee, a bunch of people in the House, Gore, the FCC chairman, that's me, a bunch of people in the Department of Commerce. We spent a lot of time and we came up with one principle. This technology that is destined to sweep the world and destined to connect everybody to every piece of information ought to be the first technology in the history of learning that is deployed in schools and libraries at the same time and in the same pace as it's deployed in business. That was the driving principle. That is why in the 1996 Telecom Act, the word that Congress used with respect to libraries, rural health care, and schools is the word should. The high-speed access should be deployed. <laughs> and that meant we had to continually have it be that it was at the same pace as it was growing as the medium of communications that it has now become uh, for the whole uh, world. Now, we didn't know how big to size it in 1997. We did a big study with McKinsey. It was not just made up. And we decided two things. It would be done by matching grants. If a library or a school couldn't think of anyone to match with, then they must not care enough for the money. The matching grants would be weighted so that if you were from a poor area, you didn't have to have as big a match as if you were from a rich area. And then number two, <coughs> the total money that would be matched would be about $2 billion. But here's what we didn't, didn't know what to do about and didn't successfully craft. A formula for increasing the amount as the cost and demands increased. And so we did not embed that in the program. 
I'm sorry. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, we just didn't know how to do it. So we thought we would li leave it to future generations. Now, on the good side, when you add the two billion approximately that we decided to start with, and the roughly two billion that's matched with, that's four billion. And when you look at the entire program, which it's now amounted to about a sixty billion dollar spend, it is the single biggest spending for education in libraries and schools that has ever occurred in the United States, other than the GI Bill. So that's good, <laughs> and it's also good that uh, uh, not many years ago, but a few years ago, a escalator was put in. But still, what's happened is that the increases now are way below the increases on the demand side. So problem number one I respectfully submit is let's measure the difference between what is and what needs to be right now. And problem number two is let's figure out how to have a thoughtful way to go forward and keep up with the increases on the demand side. These are the two challenges for this community. There are also challenges for government. And there are challenges that I have to say, I just think it's going to be wonderful when we gather about a year from now and say, what do you know? Uh, we figured these things out. <laughs> and what do you know? We got the votes at the FCC. And what do you know? Uh, we've, we've built the infrastructure or the framing of the infrastructure that's going to survive for generations. Because that's exactly what happened in 1997. <laughs> and now we have a new generation and a new opportunity, and we can be hugely successful. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite the panelists to come on up, and um, we will move to uh, the discussion. And thank you, Reed, for that um, very thoughtful introduction to the E-Rate program and its important history. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce my uh, <laughs> colleagues. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> audience, Reed. <laughs> <laughs> we won't forget about you, Reed. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and so I'll do a quick introduction of, of the panelists up here. Um, I'm Sarah Morris. I'm the Senior Policy Counsel for the Open Technology Institute. And um, we've been collaborating at, the, at OTI with the Education Policy Program at New America to uh, work through um, some of the challenges of the E-rate reform process. But what's really exciting to me is um, one of the things that is important to OTI and important to New America more broadly is this idea of broadening conversations to include um, additional constituencies and um, to really look at problems uh, as, as an ecosystem and um, to come up with solutions that address things comprehensively rather than looking at issues in a vacuum. And so that's why I'm very thrilled to have um, this diverse, awesome panel up here. And um, I will introduce them. From uh, the other end of the stage, we have Richard Kulata. Richard is the uh, director of the Office of Educational Technology at the US Department of Education. Next to him, we have Susan Hildreth, the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences. Next to her, we have Melanie Huggins, CEO of Richard Library in South Carolina. And next to her, we have Pam Moran, superintendent of Albemarle <laughs> County Public Schools in Virginia. And finally, um, Greta Byram, who is a senior field analyst here at the Open Technology Institute. So welcome. And so I want to start um, to give the, the panelists a chance to introduce their, themselves and their work by um, throwing out a question for the group. Um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about why you're here and what this idea of connected community means to you and to your work. Um, I'll start with Richard. OK. <laughs> um, so uh, why I'm here, <laughs> we have a lot of work that needs to be done. and We need a lot of people to do it. So, so I'm recruiting. That's just to, <laughs> just to be open, right, open and, and blunt on the table about it. We need a lot of, uh, a lot of help. And by recruiting, I mean, uh, getting those of you in the room and those that are watching this to say, I get how I'm a part of the changes that need to happen, and how can I uh, join in and participate? And, and uh, what I mean there is, 
it is entirely possible, as we look at this idea of creating connected communities, it is entirely possible to get uh, very focused on infrastructure, uh, technical infrastructure, which is extremely important. We'll talk more, hopefully, over, over this uh, panel about some of the changes to E-rate that are happening, some of the other, other work that's underway. But in that process, get so focused on the technical infrastructure that we forget things like the human infrastructure. And how are we preparing people and teachers and librarians uh, and students and parents to be able to create connected communities? And how are we making sure uh, there are uh, sort of rich, engaging, interacting learning opportunities that are happening? And you'll, you'll hear some examples. There's many that we can point to, but uh, not enough. And so we really need everybody who is hearing this and friends of yours and colleagues of yours that are not here hearing this to understand that if we nail the infrastructure, if we end up a year later congratulating ourselves because we fixed this infrastructure problem, we got it all done, and don't address the issues of how are we pulling people together and thinking about how do we engage youth, how do we engage teachers, how do we engage librarians, um, arguably we have not moved uh, forward as much as we need to. And so that's my uh, goal in this conversation and I hope we can continue to talk about how we do that. And I would love to leave here with ideas and thoughts from you on how we can uh, make that happen. Susan. Well, good morning everybody. It's really wonderful to be here. And um, you know, I'm here because really a connected community for me the library is a critical piece of a healthy and thriving community in the 21st century. Um, but I have to say that the comments that we heard by Chairman Hunt were so, um, so important and so convincing that I am almost speechless in terms of all my talking points. <laughs> so, so he's really made the case very well for libraries. But just to reiterate that, you know, particularly uh, libraries have been uh, the point of free access uh, to the internet for the general public, our students, our, our college students, lifelong learners, all kinds of folks. And we still know that in our rural communities, um, we know that 70% of our, in our rural communities are the only free internet access in their communities. So I think we know all these facts. We know why it's important to have a robust connectivity in our communities. And I think what I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about is the importance and the acknowledgement of libraries as critical elements in our educational infrastructure. And I think that uh, although I know everyone here in the audience and everybody who's listening in on the web I think understands that, there's still a large gap in that understanding I think in our uh, community and country at large. Many people still have the traditional view of the library and don't really understand how much we are a critical element of keeping all of our citizens up to date for all ages. So I just, I want to make sure that I, wherever I go, I talk about the critical educational role that libraries and also museums, that's my other hat, <laughs> play uh, and, and the fabulous content we have to share and discover and give uh, opportunities for content, content creation, all of which cannot succeed without great connectivity. But I'm here to make sure that all of us out there, as, as Richard said, you know, get on the bandwagon and understand that our libraries are continuing to play their important role of their community's university for everybody and community hubs and anchors. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Really? Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm, uh, in my day job, I'm the director of the Richland Library in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, and I'm sitting beside a fellow South Carolinian, which is really awesome, too. We, did just, we just found that out about each other. Um, but I'm also the, um, the chair of the board of the Urban Libraries Council. So in, in that capacity, you know, I see the good work that libraries are doing across North America uh, among all of our members. And I, you know, I can obviously reiterate everything that's been said so far, but there's, there's something that I've been thinking a lot about lately, which is not just mapping current state and how to make everything from the E-rate formula better and just and more, um, more, more capacity there for libraries, but it's about what the future of communities needs to be. 
So for example, we, we in, our, in our own library, um, we already know, you know what our bandwidth is and that it's not enough and that things are slow in peak hours. And we have aspirations to you know, be from 100 uh, megabit to 5,000 within the, the next couple years, which is going to be tremendous if we can get there. But I'm thinking about 10 years from now, um, we're focusing so much on libraries being not just places to store content, but for people to create content and share that content throughout the world. And that takes a tremendous amount of bandwidth capacity to be able to do that. So it's making the shift from being places to store it, where we're actually encouraging our communities to create it, to make it, to share it, to present it, to perform it, um, whatever those things are. Um, and I just, I, I, we're not getting there fast enough for us to make that cultural shift in our programming and our services because we don't have the bandwidth to support it now. So I'm, I'm interested to hear what other people are doing and, and obviously to lend any support and help that I can to the, the effort. Thanks, Melanie. Pam? I, I just, I don't even know where to begin. It just uh, is, um, there are so many things that I'm thinking about right now. And the first was that I was a little late getting up here because I was retweeting out to Connected <laughs> Communities a uh, tweet that I just received from MHS Weather, which is a group of kids at Monticello High School back in Albemarle, Virginia who have created a YouTube video on how we close or delay schools <laughs> when we have snow days. So I'd love to be able to watch their video, but you can do that. And what I think that really speaks to is the dream that perhaps at E-Rate, when it was first initialized as something that we would be able to access as a school division, actually had in mind, and maybe nobody knew then when you said that the internet is a tech of learning, of what that would look like today. But for me walking up here, it looks like Jack and his buds who have formed their own meteorology team and basically email me <laughs> or tweet to mm -hmm. me what the weather is going to look like and suggest whether I should open, close, or delay school <laughs> <laughs> is, I think, a great representation of the possibilities that were dreamed back in 1997. At the same time, I will tell you the story that I think also is representative of the challenges. I think that Jack and his friends represent the dreams of what can go on in schools. I think Sharice Morris, who went to uh, Brown University two years ago, represents the challenges. In Albemarle County, 726 square miles, we surround the University of Virginia. We have the Blue Ridge on one side. We have the Piedmont of Virginia on the other. That we have every challenge and every success possibility of any probably school district or community in the United States because we have significant swaths of the community that can't connect, and we have significant swaths of the community that can. But the reality is that Sharice grew up in Esmont, Virginia, which is one of our places where AT&T and Verizon and all the folks that are out there as uh, commercials have no interest in that community because they are not a community that has enough people to really support making any money. So the reality is in that part of Albemarle County, both the geographic challenges as well as just the, the density challenges of the people kept Sharice from being able to, con to make connectivity um, happen in her own home. Um, a child living in an economic, economically disadvantaged environment, and she has shared her story very publicly and would feel very comfortable with me sharing with you today. I had a teacher in a school that, that recognized Sharice's capability. And what this teacher did was that she gave Sharice, an old cell phone. Sharice, in her school, because of the fact that we have really prioritized focusing on having internet connectivity in our schools, was able to both file all of her applications for college as well as her FAFSA um, uh, application. She ended up full boat ride to Brown University, mm -hmm. but this is a kid who was so challenged to be able to have that kind of connectivity in her own home that she would come to school early in the morning, catch a ride with a friend, and stay late so that she could do the work that she needed to do in a school setting. I think that represents the challenges of communities today, but also represents the, the success stories of schools that have connectivity. We have really looked at our libraries and our schools as a first line of connection mm -hmm. out to the greater community as well. We partner with the Jefferson Madison Regional Library System and do some shared servicing. Our kids, we register all of our third graders as patrons of our regional library system 
in exchange, we get to download from OverDrive um, yep. <laughs> ebooks, et cetera, for our kids. But one of the things that we've really tried to do is to figure out how can we have shared services mm. with our libraries. Also, interestingly, with our police department. Mm -hmm. We make all of our school sites, our internet um, capabilities are uh, accessible to our police department mm -hmm. so that when they're riding around and they need to stop and get online, they can pull up in our parking lots mm -hmm. and they can get on their computers and log in and do their reporting. Mm -hmm. We also are looking at how we can build hotspots out in places across the community. We've talked about what would it look like to have hotspots in parks? Mm -hmm. What would it look like to have hotspots in places mm -hmm. where kids can get or our community members can get? But I will tell you probably the most interesting things that we're doing. And we're not real certain exactly how we're doing this because we don't know anybody else that is doing this. We took our educational broadband spectrum back from leasing it just a couple of years ago. We are now building out as a school division our own, oops, there goes my stack of technology. <laughs> <laughs> we are now building out our own EBS spectrum to connect our community. And we're figuring that out as a school division because we know we can't wait on our commercial sector to do that. And what we want is for our kids to be able, whatever device either they have in their home or that we can put in their hands, to be able to take those home and do their homework, mm -hmm. connect with their peers, access our public library system, <coughs> museums around the world to do the work that we believe was probably the dream that you had, mm -hmm. but maybe not known at that point mm -hmm. in time in 1997. That's what we need help with, is to figure out how do we do that and do it well. Great, thanks Pam. Sorry. No, no, <laughs> that's great. Um, so, hi everybody, I am here representing the Open Technology Institute um, at the New America Foundation. And I am here all the way from upstairs today <laughs> 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 to um, talk about our work um, in the fields of, um, you know, really thinking about broadband connectivity and what it does for communities. Um, my particular area um, of work within the Open Technology Institute is the field team, um, the field operations team. And you might ask why a DC think tank has a field operations team. Um, it's definitely an unusual um, kind of activity to happen within an institution like this. Um, and the answer is that we found that in order to really feel like um, we were making policy recommendations that were informed by reality. Um, we needed to really understand what was going on in communities. Um, so we really wanted to understand stories like Pam's. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what's really happening with people? Mm -hmm. um, and what we found in that work, um, you know, some of the ways that we, we have done that work is through programs like the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program, uh, which um, I'm, we'll talk about more, I'm sure, but that was a um, federal stimulus program, part of the National Broadband Plan, um, and brought infrastructure as well as broadband um, adoption training and public computer centers to communities across the country. Um, so we worked with the BTOP program um, as both conveners of coalitions applying for funding and also as evaluators um, on that program. So we would do things like hold focus groups with people who are using these um, resources both in Detroit and in Philadelphia, uh, which was the two sites where we worked. Um, and in those focus groups, we would hear people saying things like, um, you know, I learn better when um, when the person who's teaching me is someone that I can relate to, someone that I feel comfortable with. Um, and we started to really see the importance of, you know, beyond just giving people technology or giving them um, curriculum, there's a whole kind of um, range of social support. I didn't. Guess you're done. <laughs> 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 Hello. <laughs> okay. So I was just saying, um, there's a whole range of 
social support needs that people have in order to really engage in an active learning experience, feel comfortable with technological tools, and um, have the kinds of experiences that folks here were, were speaking about. Um, and I just want to underline something that Richard said about human infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, we have a very similar concept that we have derived from our work directly with communities, which is um, what we call social infrastructure. So it's a very similar notion. Um, it's about what it takes for people to be, um, to be active learners. Um, and it goes beyond perhaps just um, what <laughs> individuals <laughs> I could just use PAMS for now. OK. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about active learning. So the role of institutions, the role that institutions also play in this. Um, and those institutions are what we call it, um, community anchor institutions. So mm -hmm. schools and libraries are really important community anchors. There are other kinds of community anchors. But these are the, both the brick and mortar institutions and also the social networks that provide the kind of support that people need to be active learners and to feel engaged and supported um, as they learn and uh, you know as they become meaningful adopters of broadband meaning which to us means not just that they have a subscription in their home but also that they feel comfortable using technology and they're able to access uh, the kinds of tools and resources that they need. Um, so I'm really excited to Double <laughs> Thanks, Pam. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here with all of you because I think, in a way, um, all of us kind of represent this sort of um, field operations work where mm -hmm. we're actually interfacing with people and communities and making sure that policies um, respond to real needs um, and are, you know, are supporting people in the way that best. Uh, can lift all boats. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greta. That, that was a very fantastic uh, sharing of connectivity that just happened up here. Um. <laughs> More ways than one. <laughs> um, so thank you, guys. That was all. That was a fabulous uh, introduction from from all of you. And um, I want to dig into some of these concepts a little bit more deeply. Um, Pam, you did a wonderful job of talking about how your community is using technology and the various um, tools that have um, emerged as a result and the success stories and challenges that you've seen. I'd like to open that question, uh, expand on that a little bit with some of our other panelists, um, particularly Melanie and Greta, but also anyone who has these types of, of stories. Because we, we do focus a lot on um, connectivity and what that connectivity looks like and what that means. And that's the crux of, of uh, our recommendations from OTI to the, to the commission. But I also think that the other side of that and what really drives that need is, is the use and, um, and, and what that technology can bring to communities. So I'd like to dig in a little bit more if, if folks are willing. Yeah, I, I can start with that. Um, you know, I, I make a lot of assumptions when you get a lot of smart people in the room that you all know what public libraries do in the 21st century. But um, Reed's probably one of the smartest guys I know, and he'll even tell you that he's learned a lot about what we do <laughs> over the last month or so. So I'll just start by saying that, um, I, you know, I, our library system is one main library and 10 branches. Uh, we serve a population of about 400,000 people across 700 square miles. Um, we have very rural communities within Columbia, South Carolina, as well as very urban and suburban, so everything in between. Um, 8,000 visits a day throughout the library system to our <coughs> branches. We have 400 computers that support those visits. And 50 of those are dedicated in one space to business and job development. We are fortunate um, with some funding that we received from the Knight Foundation years ago that we have a full-time career counselor on staff, a full-time job readiness trainer on staff, and those 50 computers are used almost every hour that we are open from 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night. We're open, that, that's our hours most days. 
And those computers are used, and those folks that come in to use them are doing everything from practicing interviewing online, where you're videotaped and you get to see what you look like interviewing, to developing resumes, to filling out job applications, to starting business. We even just opened a co-working center in our main library. So um, that is the kind of work that we've been doing for years. I think we're doing it in a more coordinated way now and partnering with everyone from the Department of Employment and Workforce to the universities to small business incubators throughout the community. So I don't want to make the assumption that you all know that that's what we do. That's just, that's just what libraries do now. That's just a daily part of our, of our life and activity um, you know, and different scales and different sizes across the country. Um, we also are doing so much more work around getting kids to think beyond high school. So not just about high school graduation, but what's that next step? Because you can't get them to graduate from high school if they don't see any future beyond it, it's really if they don't see the value in it. So a lot more partnerships with community schools and, and organizations, um, but we've dedicated a lot of resources and technology to teens and young people in our library. Um, like many libraries across the country, we now have a dedicated creative technology space for teens with 3D printers, <coughs> um, you know, music production software, a vocal booth, um, and we're constantly bringing in experts in the community, um, experts in filmmaking coming in and doing programs with our teens and showing them how to do animation and make films and edit them. But then that's, that beautiful content, this is where I was talking about when I started, it needs to live somewhere. It needs to not just be um, developed for the sake of going through the process, but where can a teen build that portfolio of, of information and content that they've created so that when they get ready to go and apply for college, not only do we help them with the FAFSA form and do all of that, but we also have this wonderful body of work um, that takes a tremendous amount of bandwidth to do that and to store it. And the more things that go to the cloud, the more bandwidth we need. So it's, you know, it's just that kind of, um, conundrum that we can foresee some really innovative things that we could be doing with our populations. Um, and we are building the human capacity. We know that librarians don't have all the skill sets that we need them to have to do this work, but we're bringing in partners and educators and creative types all over the place to make that work. So those are just two examples. I will tell you that um, we did a survey uh, uh, throughout South Carolina recently to see um, how people were using computers in South Carolina South Carolina libraries on a daily basis. 2,000 people a day walk into a South Carolina library to use the computer for business and job related activity. And right below that, and this is what you know sh should surprise no one in this room, was health. Health related research, applying for Medicaid, applying for Medicare, managing their relationship with their doctors, researching their own conditions. Health was there. And then the third, banking people using those public, not private infrastructures for managing their finances. So when you think about that, and you think about how essential those things are to all of us in this room, um, and how we take for granted that we're able to do those things um, you know, very seamlessly, I, that says to me that capacity and connectivity is as essential as any other utility that we have, whether it be electricity or water. Mm -hmm. um, so those are just a couple of examples of what we're doing in, in our library. You know, it's, it's really interesting that you say that. I guess that is mine now. Now you're dead. Ah, technology. Yeah, I think it's working. We got you. That one of the things that, that we find, because we, we made the decision, we are probably one of the most unfiltered school divisions mm -hmm. anywhere in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, and one of the things that, that we also did very purposefully just a few years ago was that we divided our um, uh, wireless access in our schools so that we have a guest uh, easy access walk into our schools you can log on is how many parents come into our schools mm -hmm. and use that as a part of their work that they're doing in a variety of ways that have nothing to do with their child right. in school but when you think about how many school divisions have gone to online portals for everything about their child mm -hmm. and how many parents are still living in places where they don't have access mm -hmm. and so you see that digital divide that plays out is not just about the kids but it is also right. about the families and the greater community but the kinds of things that I also see as divides and, and we have very purposefully um, gone after using our capital improvements money as a school division and our E-rate money and a little bit of money that we get from the state of Virginia to say that one of the most important things that we do is to provide access in our schools. 
So we've made very conscious decisions to make cuts in areas that don't impact that as we've all gone through the recessionary years as the rest of the country has. But the kinds of things that we see our kids doing today, and I think about when I talk to teachers who either talk about how they don't have uh, access because of filtering systems in their school divisions, or they just flat or still literally um, without wireless technology at all. A great example is I had a teacher, a third grade teacher just three years ago, who had a kid ask the question when they were doing a simple machines unit in third grade, is a straw a simple machine? This teacher happens to have a Twitter account, Mr. T class. <laughs> and rather than telling the kids what he thought, he said, let's ask the world. And the kids put that question out. Within a matter of just a few hours, they had a NASA astronaut who picked it up down in, uh, who was on the ground down in uh, uh, Texas, who responded. They had scientists from the New York Hall of Science. They had physicists from the University of Nottingham and a host of people weigh in on that. It got to be so hot and, and fast in terms of the, and 140 characters couldn't do it. They opened up a Google Doc, and all these people started putting this in. Now the <coughs> kids are in class testing this themselves. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the teacher is interpreting with the kids what all these people are saying that are weighing in. One of the things that's pretty fascinating is that because that Google Doc was made public, and the link is just out there, People are continuing to add to it, and every now and then we continue to go back to it in the system and take a look at it. What but was the conclusion? Is, is it a is Well, it you a know machine? what? This is pretty <laughs> fascinating. The scientists said that at the time when simple machines were conceptualized, that there were questions that were not being asked that to technology today causes you to ask. So they argued about it, and you know what? They never resolved <laughs> the response to it. But the thing that I think is fascinating, whether it's kids Skyping with a scientist who's in Antarctica, or I watched a issues in modern world class at one of our high schools um, during the, the Egyptian um, uh, revolution. Uh, they were, were connecting over the internet via Skype with an Egyptologist during that period of time who was kind of boots on the ground in that revolution. They were able to Skype with this man over the course of the year I walked in in March after this had been going on and watched the kids Skype. And this guy was pretty demoralized because they were about to go into the election and you know there was controversy over uh, the fact that, that some of the folks that were running were uh, going to take them in different directions. And this guy was really demoralized about it. And when they got off of the Skype, these kids, regular, just regular, all American kids, looked at each other and said, do you think our forefathers ever felt that maybe things weren't going so well in our revolution? Mm -hmm. And I thought, all of a sudden, the American Revolution, mm -hmm. here we are, home of Thomas Jefferson, Albemarle County, Virginia, <laughs> became so real for these mm -hmm. kids in a way that would have never occurred without connectivity. And I believe as a superintendent that every kid in the United States of America deserves to have those experiences mm -hmm. in their schools and when they go home at night and they want to continue those conversations and access their public libraries and museums around the world, and for us to not do that denies our kids something that, I love this quote by Michelle, Mitchell Baker who's with Mozilla, mm -hmm. and she said, the internet is the structure of modern life. Mm -hmm. So you think about anchoring the physical infrastructure in what Richard talked about, which is the people structure, I think that really captures it. Mm -hmm. And to not do what we need to do as a nation puts us in a position of, you talk about no child left behind, mm -hmm. no nation left behind, based on the data that we have mm -hmm. from around the world today. That's why we do it, is for our kids, not just in Albemarle, but everywhere. If I could just yeah, Greta, please. Just follow up on that. Um, I think those are really important points, and I love those examples, and to me that sounds like best case scenario, it's, it's an <laughs> awesome, awesome kind of example. Um, I think there are a lot of schools that, that aren't able to get there yet. That's and right. that, you know, they can look to examples like this and stories like this for inspiration. Um, but it brings to mind um, something for me which is um, around literacy, right? So what do we mean when we say digital literacy? Mm -hmm. These kids are very, very digitally literate. Mm -hmm. 
um, and access as part of developing that kind of literacy. Um, but there's a lot of things that people need to learn. For instance, if they're using libraries for um, banking mm -hmm. and for public health um, you know, information exchange, uh, people need to learn about the basics of privacy with regard mm -hmm. to um, using public computer facilities. Um, so, you know, what I think there's a, a deeper dive that needs that needs to go on. I, I think you mentioned um, partnerships and mm -hmm. um, ways to kind of, um, you know, do skill sharing and information sharing to build the kinds of um, tools that we need mm -hmm. to develop literacy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's I think a conversation that really needs to happen alongside mm -hmm. the conversation about <coughs> infrastructure. Um, you know, kids are digital emissaries. What role could they play mm -hmm. in bringing some of these skills and some of this knowledge mm -hmm. um, home to their parents mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, in, in improving the lot of all the families in the community? Mm -hmm. uh, if I could just add quickly to that, and I think you're, that's so true about the work that needs to be done there. Um, but I want to make sure everyone knows that one of the key priorities for the Institute of Museum and Library Services is digital inclusion for all. So we have a number of documents on our website, imls.gov, about creating digital understanding and awareness in the community, why we want to be connected in our community. And we also have supported, through working with partners nationally, a lot of work on digital literacy mm -hmm. for all ages. So it is a big issue, and we're making a difference there. And also, particularly circling back to Reed's comments about our adults, we also have to work with adult literacy in terms of digital literacy, mm -hmm. yes, but also basic literacy. And this is a huge <laughs> factor with the unemployed population. How can we use our technology to help them be skilled and competent mm -hmm. for the workforce? So digital literacy is a huge issue that I think, you know, as one of our key federal priorities, we're working on that constantly. Mm -hmm. But we can always use help with everybody out there. So <laughs> help join the struggle, the challenge. Great, and I, I think that that helps paint a very interesting and nuanced picture about what, what the role technology, about the role that technology plays in, uh, in the development of, of learning tools and uh, social tools and basic life tools um, in our every, everyday lives. I want to shift a little bit. We've talked uh, about the benefits of technology and how we're using technology. I want to uh, ground this a little bit in the actual reform process that's happening. Um, and to turn back, so the, uh, I think we have some handouts, hopefully everyone who wanted one got one, explaining sort of the, the timeline and process that's gone into this Connect Ed slash E-rate reform um, effort that's being led both by the administration and the FCC. Um, and while a large part of that is the actual FCC E-rate reform, another part of that is um, work that's happening at the uh, Department of Education. And so Richard, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the role of the Department of Ed and how you see that fitting into some of these discussions. Yeah, sure, thanks. So, uh, so that is, uh, it's a great way to set it up. We, what the President has called for with Connect Ed initiative is to make sure, you know, within five years that basically schools and libraries across the country are connected to broadband. Uh, so high-speed internet, that they have access to uh, teachers that actually um, don't just sort of know about technology, but actually can thrive in a connected environment where there is devices that are able to be, you know, in the hands of these students. Because again, you can do a whole lot of work and get internet, you know, wireless beaming out of all the mm -hmm. schools. And if you don't have devices to connect to it, it doesn't do you much. Mm -hmm. And so we need to do that. And we, we talk about having those uh, devices as affordable, affordable devices. And we talk about that as in terms of kind of equivalent to what schools are currently paying for textbooks, right? If, mm -hmm. if we can make that transition, that's a huge step. And then the last piece is having this great engaging uh, content materials that students are able to use and whenever possible make sure those are open and free. There's a huge amount of great open digital content uh, out there. It's really hard to find. Yeah. And, and, and it's not because, so some people think, well, we just need more of it. Uh, maybe in some areas we do, but, but more isn't necessarily the problem. I had a teacher that said to me, I don't need 3,000 videos teaching mm -hmm. about gravity. I need one, but it's got to be a really good one. Um, and really good is different depending on, on, on uh, what, what the needs are. And so what we're trying to do is say, uh, with the Connect Ed initiative, is how do we reimagine uh, and, and sort of reinvent learning when it's supported by a powerful digital infrastructure? And so that's, that's really the, the goal. A couple things that I would, I would say. One of them is that we really have to rethink some things about school. We have to rethink things like 
uh, seat time. We have to rethink things like why do we teach every kid the same thing when there are 30 kids in the room and they all have different passions, needs, and, and interests. Um, we need to rethink. So, so going back to this conversation we had before, uh, I would summarize a shift that we were talking about here in some of the examples of from being providing information to kids or adults mm -hmm. and shifting that to how do we create creators. Right. I think that's a really important mm -hmm. question we all need to be asking. How do we create creators? Mm -hmm. we, you're going to see an example of this on Friday. Hopefully you all can watch. If you go to um, uh, the White House Film Festival, if you search for that on Google, you'll get to the White House Film Festival site. We, uh, we were concerned that as we were talking about Connect Ed, it was becoming very, you know, megabit and brought and rates and fiber and cable and it was and we were losing the point that this is about reimagining learning. Mm -hmm. And so we said, how do we best do this? And the decision was let's let's make a call out to students across the country for them to tell us how technology can either ch is changing their, their learning or could in the future. We thought, well, we'll get a couple couple hundred, maybe a thousand videos on a good day. I think we pulled the plug when we were over three thousand videos from students that came back. They had to be made by students three minutes or less talking about how technology is or could change their life when it comes to learning. They're fantastic. And it's all because you know, these, we put these kids in a creative role. And so, go, so watch on, uh, on Friday and we'll, they'll, be, they'll be posted so you'll be able to see them all uh, afterwards. But that's a, that's a piece that we need to be thinking about. And, and one final thing that I'll, I'll sort of say here is I would love for us to shift a bit from not just talking about digital literacy, mm -hmm. but thinking about digital citizenship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a digital citizen? We talked about some great examples here about uh, Obamacare being a program that's, you know, access happens through you know, online. We talked about jobs. We talked about health. What does it mean to be a digital? In, 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 in school, when I used to be a teacher in school, and we used to talk about things like, hey, don't run in the halls. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't steal stuff out of somebody else's locker. Right? Mm -hmm. Those were all conversations that we had. <laughs> what is the digital equivalent of that? Mm -hmm. right? What does running in the halls look like in a digital space? What does stealing from somebody's locker look like in a digital space? And I'm not hearing that conversation as much as I would like to. And so mm -hmm. I think we really need to think about what does it mean to create digital citizens, and how do we help have that conversation and support kids being involved in, in coming up with that answer. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. I love that idea of, of digital citizenship, and I, I think that's something that we'll talk more about internally and hopefully here. Um, I, I want to shift a, again a little bit to the FCC because that's where I know we, we've uh, we've been talking about the that there's been too much focus on on connectivity or capacity or how much or how little or what. Um, or the, the details, but I think that those there details... There can't possibly be too much focus. We just have to make sure there's equal focus yes. on the other areas. How about that? <laughs> well, that, and that's the point I was going to make. I think we do also have to talk candidly about uh, what needs to happen as part of these important federal reform processes to ensure that all of these wonderful things that are happening in um, Albemarle, Al Albemarle? Sorry, Albemarle. Albemarle. I can't do it when I'm looking at the sheet. Okay. Um, <laughs> in Albemarle. Um, and, and to ensure that, that Communities across the country have access to this type of, of, of technolog technological connectivity. Um, and so my question to the panelists is, what, what do you see as being a priority in these proceedings? What needs to happen to allow you to do um, the things that, that you are trying to do in your communities that you represent? Anyone? I could start with just a couple. I mean, I am a federal agent. I'm representing a federal <laughs> agency, and I don't mean to talk to the FCC about what they should or shouldn't do. but. We know from libraries across the nation that um, if we could simplify the application mm -hmm. process, that would be huge. Mm -hmm. uh, we also hope, and I know the FCC is committed to developing a more flexible, flexible procurement process mm -hmm. so we could have more consortiums applying mm -hmm. and we could have longer contracts for services. So we don't want to get too much in the weeds, but those are pretty practical things that, that we need to see happen. And I also think on behalf of the rural libraries, who again are some of the, those rural communities, maybe have no free internet access. Mm -hmm. How can we uh, create a one-time capital infrastructure program mm -hmm. that's going to provi provide an incentive where maybe some of our commercial companies wouldn't necessarily go there? They will go there. Because what you've heard, I mean, there is a huge divide. Uh, and we want to make sure that people in our rural communities and also some of our low-income urban communities have the same chance to have the wonderful access to these assets we've heard about today as everybody else. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, and it goes along with what you're saying, that what we need is an incentive or to incent entrepreneurship inside our, our public sector. And here's an example. Um, right now, there are really a lot of disincentives around the current E-rate plan because 
there are so many controls on what you can do or can't mm -hmm. do depending on where you mm -hmm. fall in the layers of, mm -hmm. of the system. Um, similar to Medicaid, where states have a lot more flexibility in terms of here's the formula that says here's the money you're going to get, now figure out how you can make best use of that. I'd really love to see a very flexible focus on, for example, in Albemarle, 726 square miles, we're as big as New York City, but certainly with a lot less density. But the reality is, I have kids that are living in high poverty in rural Albemarle, mm -hmm. who are living in high poverty in urban ring Albemarle around the city of Charlottesville, 70% free of reduced lunch in some of our schools plus. And then I've got middle class Albemarle, which has you know, kids who are living in homes from uh, you know, the University of Virginia, docs and lawyers and so forth, who have everything that they could possibly need if they're living in a place in Albemarle that actually has access via, via D DSL, et cetera, and some of them aren't. But the thing that I really need is the capability to say, if I need to use some of that money to buy devices mm -hmm. so that our mm -hmm. kids going home will be able to go home mm -hmm. with a device mm -hmm. right. that will connect to our educational broadband spectrum build out that we're doing, I want to be able to do that. Right now, I can't. If I want to be able to lay, and we are laying right now 120 miles of fiber at our own expense to connect schools and government offices together in our urban area, I want to be able to use some of E-Rate to do that. And then if I need to be able to do what we've just recently done, which is to expand our, our Wi-Fi so it doesn't feel like we're sipping peanut butter through a straw, <laughs> <laughs> then I want to be able to use the money for that. Mm -hmm. And so what I really want to do is to be incented to look at the needs of a community that's varied and to make decisions based on the best way that we can serve our customers in their homes as well as in our schools and to connect to be able to leverage our resources with libraries, with police departments, with local government, and with the commercial sector where that works for us. Mm -hmm. And right now, we don't have that kind of flexibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that if we could get that, mm -hmm. it could really change the game, not just for us, but for a lot of people across the country mm -hmm. who don't see the way to get there. Mm -hmm. one, there have got to be models. One bite-sized piece, too, that I would say, so th this stuff that you're talking about is just fantastic. It's saying, how do we look at owning a fiber network? How do we look at owning a wireless? I mean, you're, it's, just, it's just phenomenal. A question was brought up earlier. What, what do you do? Is there a bite-sized sort of step for places that may not be uh, quite there? Um, and, and two things I would just mention real quick. One is uh, the Department of Ed is working on a connected schools guide, which is going to basically say, and it will be available shortly, which says here are a bunch of different ways that mm -hmm. schools across the country have connected and communities have gotten connectivity, mm -hmm. uh, options that you may not know about. That's the first one. But the second one is everybody should know right now about an a, a opportunity called Everyone On. I think most people hopefully do. I see some heads nodding. But if you don't, please go to everyoneon.org. Everyoneon.org is an opportunity for homes to, you know, folks to be connected at home at a greatly reduced price mm -hmm. if they're not able to afford uh, commercial broadband prices. So mm -hmm. I just want to throw that in That's in right. case I get, you know, hit by a bus on the way out of here that <laughs> I have not left without you knowing mm -hmm. that uh, everyoneon.org is a great resource that you can do if you're not quite to the point that Albemarle well, was. And more perhaps of those uh, programs that I, I know Learning to Go that, that rolled out not long ago. Um, I've really followed the yep. New Rochelle one where Verizon partnered and put 4G devices yep. in the hands of kids that we need more opportunities yep. for that to occur yep. because the more models that are out there, the more that you'll see superintendents, heads of library systems taking risk. But right now, it's almost as if much of the nation is almost in the dark yep. because they don't get access to even those models. Um, and I feel like, you know, what a lot of folks here are, are calling out is really the need to be able to leverage these kinds of resources out into the community mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and think about schools and libraries as, you know, beyond brick and mortar mm -hmm. institutions as, you know, hubs of civic and social support in a community. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to remember in all of this that, be, you know, schools and libraries uh, play that function. There are other kinds of institutions, other kinds of mm -hmm. organizations that also play that role. And I think um, your suggestion about coalitions and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, opening up the application procedure to coalitions is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, look at uh, cities all across the country where schools are being closed, um, where libraries are, are, have hardly any resources. And, um, you know, I'll just pull on 
our experience with BTOP a little bit to mm -hmm. say that that program was pioneering in the way that it understood the importance of all kinds of community organizations mm -hmm. as part of that network of social support, that human infrastructure, that social infrastructure. Um, so, you know, working together, coalitions of groups can, um, you know, bring communities all together into the digital world um, more so than just, um, you know, specific roles and specific kinds of institutions. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. And uh, that leads to another question I've been thinking about and, and curious about um, how, how do your various constituencies leverage the connectivity with, within institution walls out into the community? We've talked a little bit about the um, Wi-Fi mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. initiatives that Pam mentioned. Um, I know that Greta has some she can talk about with her work in uh, Detroit and New York and, and Philadelphia. Um, but what, what does connectivity outside of institution walls look like and, and what sorts of thing, how does that fit into the uh, E-rate reform process? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what would be helpful to ensure that you have the support to do, to do more robust connectivity outside of the institution walls? Well, the flexibility is uh -huh. key. The flexibility on how to spend the, the resources. Um, we do have hot spots that we're starting to put in around the community in places that are underserved. Um, and w what we really want to do, and we have plans to do, is to do what a lot of libraries have already figured out, which is you buy a mobile unit that's a teaching classroom mm -hmm. that's wired that can go to anywhere where there are gaps. It's, a um, it's like a bookmobile, but it's a classroom. You know, it's you know they're really uh, Houston has one, <laughs> Memphis ha Memphis Public Library has one, but that doesn't have to that doesn't have to be a library only mm -hmm. right. um, functionality. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of schools already have those. You know, there's a lot of schools, but then they sit dormant. You know, they sit there, you know, in the afternoons and weekends and the evenings. So if we could develop these consortiums and, and use the E-rate money to buy in this collaborative way and invest in a, you know, citywide wireless uh, mobile lab, um, that would just be one step in filling in the gaps. But putting the hotspots in are certainly something that we're trying to do. There was really a funny article in the state paper um, in South Carolina recently about all the people that sit in the parking lots of the library mm -hmm. after we close using the wireless. Um, they sit in the parking lots, they sit outside on benches, so after hours. They, and so that's one of, and now it's become like the 24 7 calling card of the library. And as we redesign the physical spaces, right. we're going to start thinking about how we design the space for when there's no staff in the building and people want to congregate outside in a way that's safe and, mm -hmm. you know, enjoyable at midnight, they can. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes more like, the Apple Store yes. in New York. Two o'clock in the morning, you go in you there, go in and, and people are in there doing all kinds of things. How do our libraries and schools start to function more like that as well? Right. But and I think about it, too, from the standpoint that if you go back to that, that concept of connectivity, that it's less about connecting spaces mm -hmm. and more or places and more about just being sure that when you think about that no matter where people travel today, they take their computing mm -hmm. with them. How is it you make sure whether it's kids or families that you serve, no matter where they go in the, the community and they're taking their computing with them, that they're able to get mm -hmm. connected? So the keeping the people connected mm -hmm. is the key. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it almost fights against the nature of, of broadband technology to sort of confine it within right. um, okay. a brick Absolutely. and mortar place, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I think, you know, Pam and I were talking before about the exciting work that um, she's doing in her community with TV white spaces as a way to propagate, um, you know, Wi-Fi signal throughout the community. Um, so that's that's really exciting, and um, you know, that's a, another sort of regulatory measure, you know, freeing up TV white spaces mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. to do that kind of work. Um, we work in the communities we work with with mesh technology, which is another very exciting kind of technology because you need really a community process and you need people in the community who are digitally literate in another way um, to be able to actually be part of building these networks. Um, so building the network can itself be a community building activity. So mm -hmm. you know, that's a kind of device literacy and it requires people who not only know how to use, um, you know, how to play with broadband, but also people who can climb up on rooftops and can organize <laughs> their neighbors right. and all kinds of stuff. So I think there the sort of endless possibilities for like the technical means by which mm -hmm. you take, you know, 
uh, bandwidth and spread it out in the community. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, it's another set of exciting learning, active learning. And you know, I would really, I wish that, that we could have this conversation with Reed about what his dream was for <laughs> EBS. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that I know based on conversations with superintendents around the United States is most of us have taken our EBS and we lease it to someone and those people just sit on it mm -hmm. and don't do anything with it because they're waiting for a time where they can really make money with it. And so the reality is we've tied up mm -hmm. this huge educational broadband spectrum from actually being used for mm -hmm. connectivity. And so when ours came open, that was a real pivot point for me as a superintendent to say, you know, and you said, Angela, I don't know anybody who's doing this. I said, let's take it back and figure out how we can use it to make it do what it was supposed to do, I think, originally. I don't know. Well, um, well and I think that now that presents a good time to open it up for audience questions. Um, do we have someone at the back with a microphone? Okay, great. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, so I, I invite anyone um, who has a question here to go ahead and put your hand in the air and we'll get to you. If not, I can keep going. But, oh, we've got one. Hi, I'm Laura Breeden. I work at NTIA on the BTOP program, so I know some of you. Um, this is all great, and it's very exciting, and it's very visionary and optimistic, and sometimes it's really hard to feel visionary and optimistic here in Washington, so thank you all for coming, especially those who came from farther away. Um, and I'm sure we have a few lawyers in the room, so I'm going to ask a question about I think these are great ideas personally. I mean, I, I, I'm not speaking for NTIA necessarily about every single idea, but what is it possible for us to do within the current regulatory regime around flexibility in the use of the E-rate funds? And what would it take to get to a place where we could use the funds for devices, for wireless, for community-based facilities, or to share with the community? Um, and Reed, you might know <laughs> something about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, we'll pass the mic. Hold, hold on just for one second, and we'll get you a mic, so Chairman I Reed. I apologize for speaking more than once. Uh, uh, so uh, in the world of Washington, which is not reality, it's just the reality as we know it here, um, I, I think that there's, uh, I think it's really important to um, do something that's a, a useful guide to uh, all activities uh, in life, and that is to try to stand in the other person's shoes. So the other person in question would be the current chairman of the FCC. Uh, so Tom Wheeler, in um, December of 1994, uh, was the head of the Cellular Trade Association, and uh, not in that capacity, but as a friend, he came to me and he said, um, let me come over to your house this weekend. Congress had just gone from, Repu from Democratic to Republican in the House and in the Senate. Uh, and I uh, thought, well, you know, what, what's going to happen now? Because Speaker Gingrich had announced that the FCC should be closed as an agency. So that seemed to be about to bring a fairly rapid uh, halt to my um, then one-year-old uh, government career. It also didn't seem to indicate that the E-rate had much of a chance of happening. So Tom said, uh, I don't want you to give up. Uh, I want you to recognize that all these things take time, and I want you to recognize that you have to just keep pressing forward with your ideas on both sides of the aisle, and sooner or later you'll find somebody on the other side of the aisle. That turned out to be Olympia Snow. But to answer your question, um, I have a two-part answer. Uh, first, what is the flexibility available under, under the law? The flexibility is quite significant. Uh, the reason that the law became, in an administrative sense, so ossified and so cumbersome in the way that you all experience every single day is because, now, you know, I'm really sorry, but do, do you want to know the truth or do you want to have it be that it's just kumbaya, <laughs> right? Truth, the truth. Here's the truth. <laughs> the truth is that uh, after that law was passed, uh, it pleased the uh, opponents of the next presidential nominee on the Democratic side, that was Al Gore. It pleased the opponents to say that the law was the Gore tax, and that every person in America would see it on their bill, 
and that they would all uh, hate it because it was taking from the few and giving to whoever the heck these people are that go to libraries. That was basically <laughs> the attack. So there's not one bit of humor intended in my remarks. In 1998, uh, Congress uh, used uh, grand juries to try to drive the E-rate administrators out of their jobs. They cut their salaries. In 1999, they accused all the libraries and schools of wasting the money. Uh, and they made libraries and schools uh, feel, the administrators feel that they were going to go to jail if they didn't develop really, really uh, complicated and burdensome okay. administrative processes. Maybe some of you lived these years. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, in 1999, Gore's political advisors told me that I'd made a horrible mistake ever creating the program. In the year 2000, he lost the election by, uh, when, the votes st when they stopped counting the votes, by 500 in, in Florida. And in from 2001 to 2009, the FCC thought the program was a bad idea. Not that it was a good idea, that it was a bad idea. And that's the reason it wasn't expanded or changed in those years. That's the reality of politics. Olympia Snow, a Republican, when she resigned, said it was one of the two things that she was most proud of doing in Congress. Meaning, I'm not saying everybody feels this way, I'm saying it is impossible to have a program that takes from the many and gives to the few and to think that it's no problem expanding it. <laughs> you can't have a program that takes from the many and gives to the few and say, oh, let's just have more billions of dollars, please. <laughs> you have to make the case. So I'm trying to say two things. Every single idea you all have mentioned, my heart swells. I practically cry. They're great ideas. They have to be translated into data. Mm -hmm. Reform, you have to be, as I don't want to go all zen on you, but you have to be the change you wish to become. <laughs> Meaning, if libraries cannot count the bandwidth per user, then libraries don't deserve to get any more money. It's as simple as that. If you can't count the bandwidth per user at peak times, then how could you possibly think that you're, you should get more money instead of the one million other needy claims that are made in Washington? Or maybe it's two billion other needy claims made in Washington. Number two, there is nothing about schools and libraries that isn't political. Who doesn't know this already? <laughs> you never even know what's going to hit you next, right? You, you think you're going to teach science and somebody says you're teaching uh, religion and you thought it was science. <laughs> right? It happens all the time. It happens all the time. That's the nature of education and that's the nature of libraries. It's the melting pot of cultural debate. I'm not saying, I don't want to be heard to say Democrats are right, Republicans are wrong, or vice versa. I'm saying you're in a political battle. <laughs> so you have to start with the data. What is the bandwidth per user? And number two, you have to be able to say reform starts at home. These are all matching grants. Every program you came up with, if you said, and here's the non-FCC match, will you match it? you have a 90% chance of having it happen. If you say, we don't have a match, but could you just give us more money, then you have a 10% chance of having it happen. <laughs> I'm giving you a poli-sci answer. <laughs> <laughs> now you ask about the flexibility in the program. The reason for the inflexibility is that uh, f for 17 years, various watchdogs in government have scared the heck out of administrators. It's not because administrators said, I really wish to be stupid, and I really wish to burden your life, and I really wish that everything is really difficult for you. It is because they are so afraid from experience that they will be, they will be ruined. They will be ruined. So the flexibility, it starts with libraries and schools have to be hugely transparent about their contracts. Because if you're transparent, then you're protecting the administrators. So here's a lesson in, about education and about libraries. Anything really great is never learned by anybody else and is never repeated. Right? It never scales. Mm -hmm. I learned this. I taught seventh grade at the worst school in Philadelphia, and I was given nothing, and I learned very little, and nothing was passed on, and I went back there 17 years later to announce the E-rate with the mayor of Philadelphia, and he said, we ought to announce this in the worst school in Philadelphia. Turned out it was the exact same school that I had taught at <laughs> 20 years earlier. Nothing good about this story. Not one thing good about this story. 
So what am I saying? First, you have to come up with the matching grants. And if the matching grants are for anything that you want, you will find that the program will be flexible because the fact that you have the match is protection. Yeah. Number two, all the contracts need to be transparent. There should be no contracts that are not on the Internet. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be possible for people to say, I don't know what you're paying, what am I paying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many contracts are on the Internet? How many times do libraries and schools sign agreements with providers that say this is confidential? Why, do you, why does anyone sign that agreement? Mm -hmm. That's the second step. The third step, don't ask for flexibility. Have the contract say, these are all the things we want to do. We will have the match pay for anything you don't allow, and mm -hmm. we, you can pay for everything that you will allow. Mm -hmm. And then you'll find that it's completely flexible. Th this is all reality. I'm sorry if I've uh, hit the, you know, the note that's out of tune on the piano, <laughs> but I'm saying to you all, uh, if I'm Tom Wheeler, and if I'm going to Tom Wheeler the way he went to me in 1994, and if I'm going to say to him, and if you all are going to say to him, you know, we really want to help you, you have to really help him. <laughs> you have to not just pat him on the back, you have to say, this is all we're going to do for you. And then all the flexibility will be found. All those administrative processes and the regulations, they were all put in there over the year to protect people from public criticism. They're not, they don't come from the statute. Can I, Sorry, folks. Yeah. Can, can I just throw in, I, I just want to throw in two really practical possible answers to that as, as well. So one of them is um, there is, you know, E-rate modernization that's happening. And even light speed, speed which, at which that is happening is still slower than answering your immediate question. <laughs> so Chairman Wheeler has said there will be $2 billion mm -hmm. that will be made one this year, one next year, and has given lots of indication that that will be much more flexible in, in the way, or at least more flexible in the way it's used in the meantime while E-rate is being modernized. So that's the first thing, is look for how a billion dollars this year and next year can be used in some more flexible ways. The second piece is just about a week ago, I put out a dear colleague letter from the Department of Ed saying how federal uh, U.S. Department of Ed funds can be used. There are $14 billion in Title I, $2 billion in Title II. Now, let's be clear, that money is going to very important things now. So, so I want to I be really clear about it. It's not like it's just sitting there not being used. But those are funds that if used correctly and used in coordination with other uh, uh, programs in schools could be used to help deal with some of those issues. So those are two things right off the bat of, of areas where there's some additional flexibility, even while the E-rate modernization is happening. And by the way, I think end of this month-ish, we're supposed to see what those flexibilities uh, will be as, as the FCC puts out some more uh, detailed guidance. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I'd also like to respond really quickly just on the point of data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's great that you're bringing this up. Um, and I think that um, you know, it's important to note with data that that itself is also a political mm -hmm. question. How do we define uh, metrics? You know, what are the, the important metrics to, um, to use when measuring the success of any kind of program? Mm -hmm. Right, so the, p the process of actually defining the metrics becomes very political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for instance, um, what, what were the metrics, this is something we did a lot of work on, what were the metrics to define success for the BTOP program? Were they um, percentage of subscribers um, by household per census tract or something like that? I mean, and, and you get into really, really wonky discussions here, but it really matters. Um, and so I think like we all have a lot of work to do to make sure that the metrics are meaningful um, and also that um, there are standards for data. So that means um, that not only do we need to have meaningful metrics for E-rate, but we also have to have open data and meaningful open data for um, Connect to Compete, um, for Internet Essentials, for all kinds of digital literacy and, and other kinds of you know, connectivity efforts that are happening. Um, so we are, we look forward to <laughs> engaging with all of you to, um, to establish open data metrics and standards going forward. I think it's going to take all of us and it's going to take people working in the real world to talk about mm -hmm. what those metrics mm -hmm. should be. They're not going to come from, uh, you know, politicians. <laughs> and they're different for, they, they, they might need some flexibility to be different for public libraries than they are for schools, mm -hmm. which is one of the biggest mm -hmm. challenges that we've had in applying. Um, you know, in the EDGE program that ULC and Gates and all uh, other folks are working on right now, which is, you know, establishing what that capacity is for libraries and for communities, I think is a nice tie-in to what we're talking about 
here, but I'm going to go way up here for a second and probably get myself into trouble, although I think Rachel will back me up on this, um, <laughs> is that we have done a lot of soul searching with IMLS's lead in really talking about to what end are we providing the access, to mm -hmm. what end right. are we cr increasing the capacity. Um, I have three children who are in public schools, and I know what they use that technology for. They don't go to your school. I wish they did. You know, <laughs> I mean, they don't. So it's a I, great place to live. It, oh, I don't know about that. Um, but but I um, I like my job. Uh, but but that to what I end? That outcome it. conversation mm -hmm. is one that I know the FCC probably doesn't care about. But it does. It's not enough just to say we need this much more bandwidth per person per community. What are they doing with it? What are the outcomes? And that's where you need real flexibility and real vision mm -hmm. because the outcomes for my community might be different than the outcomes mm -hmm. for your community or slightly well, and, adjusted. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll tell you that one of the things I talk about all the time, if all you're doing is taking your technology and turning it into screen sheets versus worksheets yes. or print PDFs or just versus or testing textbooks, with it instead you haven't of, changed yeah. anything. You are just investing a lot more money to do the same things exactly. you've always done. Exactly. So what is it? And, and I like to think about that, um, you talked about creation. Mm -hmm. I think our kids are going to be incredible That's curators and creators yeah. in the future mm -hmm. as a result of the work Actually. we're doing today. But I also think about how do we really think of the work we're doing with technologies as being about expanding cognition, mm -hmm. creation, and connection collaboration. Mm -hmm because mm -hmm. those are the three ways mm -hmm. that you're actually changing the paradigm right. of what I education agree. looks like. If it's just the same thing we did in the 20th century, except now it's on what we educators call high tech while the rest of the world just calls it tech, <laughs> then I think that, that you haven't changed anything and exactly. it's maybe not a good use. So I see one more question from the audience. We'll do one <coughs> quick one and then I think we'll, we'll wrap up after that. Uh, Mary Alice, was, I saw your hand, sorry. Thanks. Mary Alice Ball from IMLS. I was going to put in a plug. Uh, Richard had mentioned everyone on. We fund a wonderful project through the Public Library Association, a division of the American Library Association, called digitallearn.org. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to go there. It's, they've got wonderful digital literacy materials and content. And by the end of the year, that content will be available not just in English, but also in Spanish and in Chinese. And I have a question for the panel and uh, maybe for Commissioner Hunt, if he'd indulge. When we look at that, that third of our nation that's unserved, the, the most rural libraries, tribal libraries, um, can you talk about match? And can we require that of libraries that are struggling to pay their electric bill? You know, how, how do we get applicants to buy in at the same time as we understand the circumstances under which they operate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary Alice, for, <laughs> for sending me that question. I, you know, I, I totally hear uh, what you're saying. I think in, in some way, though, I think that the match, and we might have a sliding scale on the match, but I do believe that some level of match for support through this program or other programs is critical because it shows that the community has somehow bought into that. So I, I would really recommend a look at a sliding scale. And I know IMLS does a huge amount of work and support in our tribal communities and our tribal libraries who are probably the most disadvantaged of all. And we're trying to make sure they at least have the opportunity to apply fairly, which has been a challenge in the current E-rate structure. So, I think that match, uh, even if it's a little tiny bit, shows that there's some commitment on the local level and an understanding of how important it is. So uh, that's my answer. Anybody else might have one? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bite. <laughs> so one thing I think that's important to note here, well, two things. First of all, this issue isn't just a rural issue at all. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many urban communities right. um, where um, resources are extremely limited, um, just as limited as the rural communities, and where adoption is just as low. Um, so we have to think about everybody. Right. Um, and then the other point that I'll make is that um, in our experience, you know, one thing about coalitions of, of different kinds of community organizations is that um, you know, we, we found in our work that community organizations may be dedicated to public health mm -hmm. or they may be dedicated to um, 
you know, supporting single parents or, you know, any number of, they may have any number of individual missions, mm -hmm. but they all understand the importance of digital access as becoming more and more central to accomplishing those mm -hmm. missions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the more that you can look to different kinds of sectors, I mean, mm -hmm. sort of um, everybody sees digital literacy as having an increasing mm -hmm. role. Yeah. Um, so I think that part of it is looking for diversification in the match and not just having the match be about, um, you know, digital literacy per se. It's these other things we're trying to get to in terms of social support and social infrastructure. And what happens when the match is the public library? It's like because the, the more people realize that that is a huge component of civic engagement exactly. or mm -hmm. um, the more they just say go to the library and do that. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we, we see, you know, we yeah. do most of the unemployment in South Carolina is filed in, you know, Absolutely. online. And, and so and we're libraries. seeing people reducing their investment because we're supposed to be there right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. bolstering, right. which we're, we're happy to do. You know, we feel like that's a huge piece of our mission. But libraries have been sort of thrust into this right. role. It, and so, it's, yes, I'm not trying to make it sound, a, well, uh, you know, like it's a, and, a bad you know, thing. It's, but a, it's an interesting mm -hmm. piece because I had a parent share with me. I don't know, a year or so ago, she said, I'm driving home from school with my two kids and uh, we're listening to the radio and something comes up about Syria and my young child, my first grader says, mom, what's Syria? I say, why don't we go to the library? library. library. My older child has my iPhone <laughs> and, has it, of course. and is passing it over to of the course. younger child. And that's what libraries are competing yeah. with in families that have that kind of connectivity. Mm. So how do libraries like schools really figure out what is it that we're going to offer in the future that keeps a level of viability hmm. about us hmm. that as we get people more connected are able to get access to resources that mm -hmm. are not in libraries. I, I just wonder have what to you jump guys in. have to say I about just that. have to jump in because yeah. Yeah. I see the I role the of the library and, and the school but the role of the library really as a networking entity. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have, we're a platform mm -hmm. We have great community knowledge, and we can make sure that those, those mission-specific organizations mm -hmm. that we're utilizing their interest and capacity and connecting them with the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. So we are that place that can bring all those resources together. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really mm -hmm. important role for yeah. us to play. And Richard, you were mentioning how all the teachers, I have a daughter who's a teacher in the New York Public Schools, and it's like, oh, I get too many of these curriculum things. I don't know what to pick. So our teachers and our librarians, that is our role, curating yeah, content. No matter how mm -hmm. much we use Google, we still get a lot of content <laughs> on there. And we need one of our key roles that we've always played is curating content. Mm -hmm. And that's that one of the assets that we can bring to this equation. We're not in competition with Google. Yeah. We lost that war long ago. Yeah, we lost that. <laughs> that's yeah. not yeah. what we do. You yeah. know, yeah. I would look that up on, yeah. on yeah. Google as yeah. well. Who wouldn't do that that's that right. has access to that? But that's but not the business we're that's in. That's right. And I think that it we really that. speaks to where you started with ecosystems. Mm -hmm. My background was in, in uh, ecology. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think about is that schools and libraries have got to move higher up the food chain oh, yeah. oh, in yeah. order to really remain viable. Because whether it's kids who are able to walk with their feet out of mm -hmm. bricks and mortar schools or, Google. <laughs> or walk out of libraries and into different spaces to get the information they need that both of those systems are going to have to change if they're going to remain viable in terms of what they offer mm -hmm. to the public in mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. and I think that this whole conversation is as much about that as it is anything Absolutely. else that we're talking about today I think that's a great place to to stop and I want to thank all of you um, all, all of my panelists for this um, really engaging and interesting conversation and for um, the audience for coming to be here and listening with us or for tuning in um, online and um, thank you all all right wow.